<laughs> to make sure that people are aware of what happened and in hopes that something like this would never happen again. The program was created in 1998, and between 1998 and 2011, there were many projects that were funded. And then back in 2016, the program was funded again, and in 2017, an advisory board was established, which clarified administrative details and encouraged the development of projects to provide information about civil rights violations or civil liberties and justices that are per perpetrated on the basis of an individual's race, national origin, immigration status, religion, gender, or sexual sexual orientation, as well as the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. So we're very honored to have this program here and to share this information with you. Um, at this time, if we're running a little bit ahead of schedule, but that never hurt of anyone. So if you would please, let us join together this morning in a moment of silent reflection and silence, please. Thank you all for that moment of silence. Um, next, we have an advisory member, Diane Matsuda, and she's going to introduce our special presenter today. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first day of remembrance from the California Civil Liberties Public Education Program. I'm so happy that this day of remembrance is starting within the State Library, and I think that you will enjoy uh, what Danielle has put together for today's program. It's my honor to introduce Hiroshi Shimizu. For those of you who have, who have been participating in Day of Remembrance ceremonies, not only in the San Francisco Bay Area, but throughout the state, you are probably familiar with Hiroshi. Hiroshi has been a person in the Japanese American community who has always been willing to tell the story of the Japanese American experience during World War II. And not only that, but to really help us to uh, do anything from setting up a, uh, a program to the actual hard work of putting out chairs and making sure that everyone uh, has a very enjoyable and informative time. So Hiroshi was born in the concentration camps. I think that um, for me in particular, my introduction with Hiroshi came when he was um, a very active and continues to be a very active member of the Thule Lake Committee. But what um, I really appreciate about Hiroshi then and now is that he always took the time to make sure that all the Nisei who participated in um, not only the Thule Lake pilgrimage, but all pilgrimages were taken care of and that their stories and their voices were truly heard. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce Hiroshi Shimizu. Hiroshi, you're still on mute. Hiroshi, I'm going to stop oh, sharing oh. so that um, you can share your PowerPoint. OK. There. Oh. Uh. 
and uh, called this uh, born and raised in American concentration camps. Um, I was born uh, at Topaz on March 19th, 1943. Now, this is the only photo that I have of myself at Topaz. And uh, I think this is, was kind of a, a stock photo that uh, somebody uh, it may be connected with the administration took of babies at Tule Lake, at Topaz, because I've seen uh, a couple of other uh, shots just like this of people that I know. Uh, same blanket and uh, same background. So uh, <clears throat> I was born at uh, Topaz, and uh, I went through seven different concentration camps until I was finally released in uh, October of 1947. Uh, I was almost five, and... Um, Four months after uh, the release, uh, I began kindergarten. So I, my entire early childhood was spent incarcerated. Um, and I, I, that's why I think this title uh, fits aptly the, uh, the presentation that I'm making today. Um, <clears throat> The first slide that I have is uh, a report from Topaz on my mother. And in it, uh, a couple of uh, FBI reports on her are uh, referenced. Uh, I'd like to read parts of it for you now. A federal investigative report dated 9 January 1942 states that subject was formerly, formerly an active member of the very pro-Japanese Kibe organization, Dai Nippon Senenkai. Subject is considered one of the few Japanese women who are within the so-called Japanese intellectual circle of San Francisco, having numerous friends within the official and big business Japanese groups. A federal investigative report dated 4 January 1943, uh, that means a, a federal uh, investigative report that was done at uh, Topaz, State subject, subject's husband, Iwao Shimizu, is a Kibe and was a reporter for the New World Sun Japanese newspaper formerly published in San Francisco. He was an active member of the Dokusho Kai and had, act, had contact with important Japanese leaders and consular officials. Subject's husband, was the recipient of a letter dated March 30th, 1941 from one Hideo Ikeda, in which he stated that he would make connections with Japan via subject's husband. Subject's husband was a member of the Japanese American Citizens League, secretary of the Japanese Association of San Francisco in 1936, 1938, and 1939. Subject's husband was on the list of candidates for departmental chairman of the Kibe Shimin, organized at Central Utah Relocation Center project, uh, which is Topaz. A federal in investigative report dated 17 June 1942 states that subject's husband's duties with the New World Sun included interviewing prominent Japanese coming through the port of San Francisco. Subject's husband went to Japan while very young and received his education there. This report also states that Iwao received a present of $1,000 from the Japanese government through the Japanese consulate for a trip to New York and that Iwao was, uh, Iwao was a very good friend of Yoji Hirota and Toshiro Saro, formerly 
Council and Council General at San Francisco. What's that? Was that a question? Someone? Oh, okay. <clears throat> So, uh, so this is the uh, the building of the New World Sun, uh, which was on Geary Street in San Francisco. Um, it's this is a photo that was in my father's collection of photos, and uh, it's the only uh, photo that I've seen of uh, the New World Sun building. So I thought it would be interesting to show it to you all. Uh, and moving on to the next slide. This was the editorial staff of uh, the New World Sun. Uh, the man on the far right is uh, Uh, my my father is second to the right. Uh, and uh, this is another photo of the editorial staff. And you could see the the sign of the of the newspaper on the building uh, on the left in English and then in the Japanese on the right. And as that reports uh, stated, he would go to the uh, incoming ships from Japan and meet the uh, VIPs that the uh, were sailing in, into or through San Francisco. And uh, uh, no, this is another photo that I found. And uh, that report kind of explained what this was, uh, but I have no idea who this important person and his family are. Then the uh, report also mentioned that there was this uh, intellectual circle uh, of Kibes in San Francisco. And uh, I have several photos of, uh, of groups like this uh, meeting. And uh, I don't know for a fact, but I, it, it seems to me that this is what that is. And these uh, uh, these are photos that uh, I don't think anyone else has uh, either. Uh, can you see my pointer? Yeah. Well, this man here is uh, Sume Azumi. Uh, he was like uh, one of the cores of uh, the. Kibe circle, and when musicians and uh, painters, poets came through San Francisco from Japan, uh, he would often invite them into his house, which I this this is a, a living room of, and uh, So he was host to uh, many things, and uh, uh, I got to know him uh, pretty well after the war. You know, I certainly I wasn't around for this period, but uh, you could see how interesting this uh, gathering seems. And then this is my mother here. Then moving on, one of the uh, 
persons in that circle was this artist, Edward Tirada. Uh, this is a picture of him at uh, in uh, Lafayette Park in San Francisco, which is uh, between Sacramento and Washington and Franklin and uh, Laguna. I recognized the path actually, because I used to play up there a lot. And even later in life, uh, I would play tennis at that, uh, in that park. And this is uh, a mural that he painted. He painted two uh, in Coit, Coit Tower. And I believe he went back to Japan uh, before the war and uh, remained there and passed away there. This is my mother's ID card from Topaz. And this is my father's golf club card from Topaz. Uh, the, it's signed by the treasurer, uh, Kimbo Yoshitomi, who I don't know, but I, I knew his brother well in San Francisco. So that, it's interesting that uh, I, I was able to make that connection. And Kimbo, I, I discovered later, was the um, first Japanese-American to become an instructor in the uh, United States Golf Association uh, after the war. Now, this is a, uh, a short note that uh, Charles Ernst, who was the project director at Topaz, sent to Dylan Meyer. Uh, and the subject was my grandfather, Iwajiro Shimizu. Mr. Shimizu's son, Iwao, and his daughter-in-law, Fusako, were scheduled to go to Roar with the first group of repatriates who went on uh, the first leg of their journey to Japan. They are on a State Department-approved list. However, Mrs. Shimizu was expecting a child at this time and was not pos and it was not possible for her to travel. The child has been born and we are making arrangements to send the family to Aurora as soon as soon as possible. They first declined the offer of repatriation and then at the time of registration reapplied. Iwao spent some years in Japan and answered no to questions 27 and 28. His wife answered no to question 27 and a qualified yes to 28. She said, yes, if my constitutional rights are restored. They applied to join Mr. Iwajiro Shimizu in the family internment camp, which is Crystal City, and were given a classic classification of A's since they had applied for repatriation. We feel that if Mr. Shimizu is eligible for parole, he should go to Aurora and wait, await his son and son's family there. Um, this next note explains what, what actually happened. Uh, Iwajiro was uh, paroled from Get rid of this thing. From Santa Fe, and uh, went to uh, Topaz on July tenth, nineteen forty-three. Uh, it was um, in August of nineteen forty-three that all of us went to 
um, left to make that journey to uh, the the exchange ship, which was uh, docked in uh, Jersey City. And so uh, what they did was they sent, uh, uh, they sent us on a train to Minidoka, where we stayed for a couple of days, and then to Heart Mountain, where we stayed another couple of days, and then to Ellis Island, uh, which had an internment camp within it. And we were there until the boat uh, got ready to uh, depart. And then when it did, they were full. And so there were 55 people that uh, they couldn't uh, accommodate on, on the trip. So I, two families went to Crystal City and the rest of us went to Aurora for about a week. And when their first train left for segregation at Tule Lake, we were on it. And in September of 1943, uh, we arrived at Tule Lake when we got there, uh, my parents had to take these mug shots and it was put on a badge that they had uh, that they had to wear all the time. I even had a badge, but mine didn't have a picture on it. We'll get to that a little later. In really short order, uh, from September when we arrived, and then in October, there was a truck, farm truck accident, uh, and the, uh, one of the uh, farm workers riding on the truck died, and that precipitated a, uh, a work stoppage of the farm workers and it happened to be right when the crops were ready for harvesting. The uh, the farm workers didn't feel they had the the confidence to uh, negotiate with the administration, so they asked uh, the people of Tule Lake to form a committee that would negotiate for them. So the people uh, held an election and one person was selected from each block. And from that uh, number, a committee was formed, which was called the Dai Hill Shah. And uh, from that group, a group of seven was uh, selected to be the negotiating committee. The administration at that time didn't believe that it was a fair election, and so they wouldn't accept the negotiating committee as representative of the people. And so uh, the director, Raymond Best, wouldn't negotiate with them, but he invited them to a meeting to talk uh, over what ideas they had which is kind of strange because he told them right out front that uh, he was not going to negotiate with them. In short, that, that led to... Um, the director, uh, Ray Best, bringing in uh, harvesters from other camps, Topaz being one of them, to bring in the crops at uh, Tule Lake. And that took any edge that the uh, farm workers had away from them. When 
the uh, the people of Thule Lake realized that those uh, harvesters from the other camps were being fed by food from their warehouse. They felt that uh, they were being robbed, and uh, they tried to prevent food from being distributed and stop the trucks. And that caused what uh, has been referred to as the incident at, at Tule Lake. And the newspapers called a riot. And when all of that went down, uh, <clears throat> 18 people were arrested. And that's how the stockade began. And then uh, the uh, army took over the camp uh, under martial law. And <clears throat> the army started arresting people based on uh, very flimsy um, information that they were getting from the administration. Within, within two weeks, there were 70 people uh, incarcerated and uh, that uh, uh, they were incarcerated in tents. And then when they became full, they opened up a, a actually a block with uh, six barracks to house the prisoners in. And eventually uh, that number grew to 350. And that became uh, the administra administration's way of terrorizing the people of uh, Tule Lake. No one was, was certain who would be arrested and what it took to be arrested and so Everyone was very paranoid, and uh, it was a way that the administration tried to control the people. Um, when that negotiating committee, which was seven, uh, was arrested, the leader of that negotiating committee held a meeting before he surrendered and he appointed uh, four people as a replacement negotiating committee. Uh, my father was one of them. That caused him to be arrested and uh, he ended up in the stockade. And this is, uh, this strange letter is uh, what my mother received uh, while he was in the stockade. You could see the date is January 1944, January 8th. Um, on December 31st, 1943, they had a, a hunger strike uh, in the stockade that lasted for six days. So it, uh, it was over by January 8th. And uh, my father makes reference to that in, uh, in this letter. Uh, and this letter is everything that remained after they redacted the letter that he wrote. Um, it's, it's interesting that uh, after they redacted uh, whatever, they typed uh, what uh, remained up, and this is what uh, they sent to my mother. And then here, you could see the the name uh, Tusako. Her name was Fusako. And uh, you could see that there are, you know there are a number of uh, typos in in this type typewritten letter. My father was in the stockade uh, for two months and uh, was released on February 14th. So we just passed the anniversary of that.
And then I'm coming to some photographs of uh, myself at uh, Tule Lake. This was taken when I was one. And I was uh, two here. And no, this is 1945 because uh, my sister was just born there in 45. And this is the only photograph that I, I have of my grandfather at Tule Lake. This, uh, this was taken in, in a studio that, that, that they had of Tule Lake, at Tule Lake. So this is a photo with probably a, a camera that they weren't supposed to have. That's my mother. That's my sister, mom, and me. Mom and me. Now this looks like maybe another photo that was taken in that studio. Here's a photo of the famous Castle Rock behind my father covered in snow. After my mother renounced her citizenship, she had to register as an alien, and this is the card that they gave her. This is the back of it. This was taken uh, the day before, two days before we left, and Tule Lake was pretty empty because I think we were the last to leave uh, Tule Lake on March 20th. This was taken on March 18th. The 19th was my third birthday, and we left the day after that and went to Crystal City. This is a photo with um, me and my badge. Uh, I, I did a little blow up of that badge here. That's inside the barracks. Maybe that's the camera that uh, my father was using to take those pictures inside the barracks. I, I don't know. But it looks like a 35 millimeter camera. Here's a photo of Castle Rock again in the background. Now this photo I I remember from from my childhood because when I saw it I I remember thinking how gloomy and so I took a crayon and drew a sun in it.
after my father got out of the uh, stockade, he, he began teaching in uh, the third ward Japanese language school. And he was uh, very intent and very serious about training Niseis to be Japanese, both in customs, culture, and language. And this is a really neat photo with the uh, the gear wheel gear they used for uh, announcing class was uh, ready to begin, and the the uh, old pre nineteen forty three guard tower. Post nineteen forty three, the guard towers at Tule Lake had straight uh, supports, not angled like that. He was the headmaster of the uh, language school. My father's here. I know this was Mr. Ikeda. And then you could see there the flag for the third third ward school. And my father's in the back here. So in March of 1946, uh, <clears throat> more pre, uh, just before uh, March of 1946, the government was trying to deport us because my parents had renounced and uh, they were deporting all renunciants and uh, Wayne Collins had, had gotten involved with uh, the Tule Lake renunciants by that time. And uh, he filed a suit that prevented the deportation. He said, uh, basically that being an alien was not a reason to, for the government to deport anyone. And so uh, he filed that suit and when the as soon as he filed it, uh, the government was stopped from uh, the deportation. And so they sent us to Crystal City, which was the last uh, concentration camp uh, that uh, they had. So these two fellows on the end are still friends of mine. Uh, they're the sons of uh, Reverend Fukuda, who was the uh, Konko minister and very important to especially the Peruvians at uh, Crystal City and getting them freed and uh, sponsored to get their freedom. I have I have a lot of memories from Crystal City. And part of that, well, part of that is that I was older, but still, you know, three and four uh, when I was at Crystal City. But uh, what was obvious to me from at you know at that time and still today is that.
it was a, a a more welcoming place than Tule Lake, and maybe you know it was also warmer. And I got to play with uh, my peers. So, you know, even for uh, somebody that was three and four, I I have a, a huge amount of uh, memories from that time. But um, as this photo shows, um, we lived in a, a duplex and we had a backyard and there were plants and you know i mean it was so totally different from living in in those uh depressing barracks at uh, tule lake here's another photo and you you know again grass And by then, um, my second sister was born there. So, I, you know, my parents actually had children at all their major stops. Me and Topaz, my sister Michi and Tule Lake, and then Junko at Crystal City. At Crystal City, my father was the Japanese group spokesman, and so he had an office. And he worked closely with Wayne Collins, uh, in, especially in, in getting people released. Crystal City had a, what they called a swimming pool. It was actually a, an irrigation pool, but uh, they made a swimming pool out of it. And uh, and I, I actually remember going into it and some of the things that happened uh, in it. George uh, George Uno was uh, Edison Uno's father, and they were who we shared the uh, duplex with. The rest of his family had uh, had been released, but uh, the government wouldn't release George, so. Uh, <clears throat> Edison was elected to stay with him, and they lived in the other unit of the building that we lived in. And this is, and he taught English and typing, and uh, I don't know other things too. And these were all uh, Peruvian students of his. These were mainly Peruvian. Everyone in the back here I know are Peruvian, but uh, Reverend Facuda is here and his son is here. So they weren't all Peruvians, but primarily. And this was May of 1947, so it's already fairly late. This is Edison while he was teaching at San Francisco State, uh, holding up a photograph of, uh, of Tule Lake.
I have uh, <clears throat> a couple of these uh, Christmas postcards that my father made. Looks like he uh, had them mimeographed or something. And he sent out uh, handmade Christmas cards. And that's it. Thank you, Hiroshi. Um, I know that um, some people had comments or um, and questions in the chat, but we do have a Q and A at the end, so we'll hold those. Um, I am going to now present on some past projects that have resulted as a part of the California Civil Liberties uh, Public Education Program. Um, so we'll go ahead and get my PowerPoint up here. Let's see, there it is. It's here. Okay. So just want to preface that um, we have uh, the California State Legislature created the California Civil Liberties Program in 1998, and it received up to $1 million annually between 1998 and 2011. Um, it was amended in 2017 by Al Maracci. Um, where did my paper just go? Um, Murat Suchi, Al Murat Suchi. And we funded 150 projects over the years. And so I'm just going to show a few examples of the kinds of projects this program has supported. And I just want to um, really point out that these are have these projects were innovative and unique. They were significant, and um, they were accessible to um, to to the public, and still are um, accessible. And in the chat, I am going to um, share some links as I go along. So this first one is the Los Angeles Opera Company, uh, LA Opera's Voices for Tolerance, part of that program. And this specific one that I'm showing pictures of was from the White Bird of Boston. Uh, Voices for Tolerance was an in-school opera for K-12 students. Uh, they engaged in the White Bird of Boston and an LA Opera Commission set in the Boston internment camp about a young Japanese girl, Akiko, who was moved into the Boston internment camps along with other Japanese Americans um, in 1941-1942. The story is about fighting for justice and tradition and family. The students also engaged in Holocaust productions and civil rights operas as well, um, like Brindabar, Fredel, and Then I Stood Up over um, the course of those um, studies. It's a 10-week residency, and students learn the opera and immerse themselves in history and the Japanese-American experience during World War II. They perform the opera at each school for students and the community, bringing awareness of this period and an understanding and tolerance for differences. Students learned about opera, uh, about performing, and about history. There were uh, about 400 students who participated and thousands of people who attended. And for this slide, I am going to share in the chat. To everyone, so everyone has access to the links that I share. This is the teaching guide, a link to the teaching guide for LA Opera. Next slide, please. And so here we have Cal State University's Japanese American Digitization Project. A consortium of California University launched the California State University Japanese American Digitization Project um, and digitized and cataloged items on Japanese Americans during the mid 20th century and World War II. Items included are from the Manzanar concentration camp, uh, camp newsletters, camp photographs, 
have school yearbooks, military service, and oral history. The public is provided with a broader account of the hardships endured by Americans whose civil liberties were stripped away. There is also a red scare, uh, which is called the Weatherwax Collection, that has uh, 2,000 items, and it parallels uh, that collection parallels the Japanese American experience, such as the McCarthy trial. Collaboratively, CSU Dominguez Hills, CSU Fullerton, and Claremont Colleges, and they digitized uh, over 14,000 items. I'm going to give you three links in the chat that will um, connect you to those collections. Okay. Next slide, please. This is the Kelly House Museum. Their project was about Mendocino-born businessman Luke Tin Eli, who led the reconstruction of San Francisco Chinatown after the 1906 earthquake. His story reflects the impact of the Chinese Exclusion Act, and his legal case was important to the eventual definition of citizenship. Uh, this project illustrated his importance to California history and examined the law as a precedent. For Executive Order 9066, directing the incarceration of Japanese American citizens and residents during World War II. Um, museum exhibit documents local exclusion in Mendocino County and the detention of Japanese Americans and public forums in Northern California communities opened the history to examination and discussion. They also created story maps. So basically there's two story maps and two exhibits. One exhibit and story map is about Look Tin Eli. Uh, how he, um, how, what his experience was as a, a businessman in Mendocino, how he helped after the 1906 quake, and um, how the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, was a precedent for uh, Executive Order 966. The other one is just on um, Japanese Americans in Mendocino County during World War II, uh, before and after. And so I have four links to share in the chat. Uh, so you can take a look at those exhibits and story maps. The story maps are especially interactive. Okay. And here we have um, the Japanese American National Museum's exhibit, um, Stanley Hayami Virtual and Augmented Reality Project, which shares a young Japanese American boy's journey, Stanley Hayami, from his home in the San Gabriel concentration camp, Heart Mountain, and then to his service in the military through his letters, journal entries, and personal artwork. This was a multi-phase project uh, distributed through a widely accessible smartphone application and an exhibition at the Japanese American uh, National Museum. This project is immersive and innovative, um, has innovative storytelling of a Heart Mountain concentration camp experience. This project also held a teacher workshop. And here are a couple links to that. In the chat. And here we have Celadon, uh, Celadon Art. They um, were the fiscal sponsor for Shadows from the Past. Seven Sensei Artists in the American Concentration Camp. It included the work of seven Sensei Artists and served as a catalyst to create social awareness and change surrounding the issues caused by the incarceration of Japanese American citizens during World War II. The exhibition highlighted the succeeding generation of artists to share personal expressions of their emotions and insights and the reluctant, deep collective acceptance of incarceration, often left unexpressed by their parents or grandparents. This project included the community through talks, workshops, and day of remembrance activities, as well as a website and catalog. Artists included uh, Lydia Nakashima, Sarah God, Riko Fuji, Lucien Kubo, Wendy Mayurama, Tom Nakashima, uh, Naomi Judy Shintani, Masako Takahashi, and Jerry Takibao. And I am going to provide a link here so you can see some of those works and how to get a copy of the catalog. And um, there's also video, I believe, on that site of uh, uh, some of the activities they did. Next slide. And um, visual 
Communications was the fiscal sponsor for the Asian American Studies Central uh, project, Building History 3.0. And the Asian American Studies Central created Building History 3.0, which is a website and curriculum project that uses the 3D construction and exploration video game Minecraft to engage young people with the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. It was youth originated by Gabriel Tajima Pena when he visited Heart Mountain and recreated it in Minecraft. So students begin with a driving question on themes such as citizenship, civil liberties, democracy, and immigration. They conduct research and then analyze and discuss that research. The students then construct virtual incarceration camps on Minecraft and present their projects at a public event. In an essay, a vlog video, they held teacher workshops to illustrate how to use that curriculum. And here is the building history website that I'm going to put in the chat. And this has resources for educators on how to use Minecraft in such a manner. OK, next slide. OK, we're there and then show. So uh, Dencho conducted, preserved, and web-hosted video life histories of Japanese Americans focusing on the immediate post-concentration camp experience in California, capturing both rural and urban experiences, as well as life in hostels and trailer camps. The downloadable interviews were transcribed, indexed, and segmented, and all available online as part of the Dencho Digital Repository. In partnership with the Garden Val uh, Gardena Valley Japanese Cultural Institution, Japanese American Museum of San Jose, and the Japanese American National Museum, Densho produced three public programs that highlighted some of the interviews and featured commentary by scholars who have studied this time period. Um, they, Densho was able to um, conduct and preserve 45 video life history and um, in addition to those public programs. And I'll go ahead and get you that link so you can, at your own free, in your own free time, uh, check out some of those video life histories on Densho. And then here we have um, the San Francisco Film Society uh, used funds uh, to create a shorter television broadcast and an educational version of the feature documentary uh, Bitter Legacy by, by Claudia um, Kedai Nagi. It tells a story about how some American concentration camps have secret prisons to isolate troublemakers, uh, how we uh, just heard from Hiroshi about Tule Lake, Tule Lake, and how those prisons were precursors to Guantanamo Bay. A Bitter Legacy won Best Documentary Awards at film festivals. The television educational version was made available to local public broadcasting stations in California. and providing a link so you can find out more and how to watch A Better Legacy. And finally, we have um, the API Cultural Center's 2023 Day of Remembrance Project. The Oakland Asian Cultural Center created a local Bay Area map marking historic sites significant to the Japanese American incarceration experience before, during, and after World War II. Accompanying the maps was, uh, were free events for the Cultural Center's 2023 Day of Remembrance programming. The project uh, was a vessel to raise awareness, build community, and encourage the visitation of historically significant sites in the Bay Area. Sites included Building 640, Military Intelligence Service uh, Historic Learning Center, San Bruno BART Station, Ken Fran Memorial, and the Buddhist Church of Oakland. And um, here is a link to their project site, which you can also download uh, the map. And um, from the screen, you can see that there's like uh, there's legends. And it's a really uh, just, I think, a beautifully done um, piece of um, accessible public material and map so that if you decide to visit that area and you want to see these buildings that are, um, many are there, many are not. Um, you can do that on your own just by visiting their site and downloading their map. Um, and that is it for a presentation on, uh, oh, we have one more. My apologies. I ran out of work, um, my workbook space. Uh, finally, we have Japanese American National Museum. 
they did a youth clubs exhibit. And so of the 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry uh, unjustly incarcerated in American concentration camps, approximately one third were children. Uh, but despite the abrupt disruption to their childhood, young people drew upon their own resilience and creativity to forge a new world for themselves. The Japanese American National Museum presented an exhibition dedicated to the many youth clubs in America's concentration camps, which shares first-person insight into the resilience and ingenuity of young Americans who had little control over their circumstances. From volunteer projects and color guards at memorial services to camping trips, social dances, scout troops, and support leagues, the youth forged friendships and community. They conducted and transcribed interviews with organization members and survivors. And here are the uh, couple of exhibits that you can visit online as well. A Raising the Flag, Coming of Age in World War II Concentration Camps, and Don't Fence Me In. And I will put those in the chat. And that actually concludes the end of that past project uh, presentation. And so I'll hand it over to our, uh, um, we'll start Q&A. And um, let me look in the chat to see what questions we have. Uh, we have a question from uh, Jeanette Meredith. Um, she asked, was the New World Sun a newspaper for um, Japanese Americans? Uh, Diane or Hiroshi, do you want to answer that? Uh, this is Hiroshi's father's newspaper, so maybe Hiroshi could answer that. Uh, <clears throat> yes, it was. Um, there were more pages uh, in Japanese than there were in English, and uh, if if there were any uh, non-Japanese. Uh, readers, sub subscribers, uh, it was very few. Um, then we have a comment by Jeanette who just, we have a comment by Lynn Hooper who said, she is struck by the compassion that your parents must have had as these photos show real effort to provide normalcy to your young life in such um, egregious circumstances. And then we have a question um, from Lindell Price, um, who wanted to know more information about Peruvian Japanese. Um, how did they come to be, uh, if you have that information, um, in, in the American concentration camp? Um, uh, my, my mother told me that. Uh, on the... Uh, first exchange of uh, Japanese for Americans, uh, <clears throat> there were many families of, uh, you know, that um, Issei families that had Nisei children. So if, if it was a family of five and they were being exchanged for five Americans, um, the Japanese government protested saying that we were exchanging two uh, two Japanese and three Americans for five Americans coming back to America from Japan. And uh, the uh, United States government's response to that was, well, hell, we'll just get some Japanese from somewhere else and they won't be Americans. So they made deals. Um, I heard they, they paid Peru $25 million to give them Japanese to exchange. So that, that was the reason why uh, the Peru Peruvians ended up here. But um They brought in more than they exchanged. So when they were left, they tried to deport them uh, to Peru. Peru wouldn't take them back because what Peru had done was they took um, <clears throat> Japanese Peruvians that had uh, the most property and the most money, uh, to, uh, confiscated all of that, and then handed uh, those people 
over to the United States. So they didn't want them uh, back to make any fuss about getting their property and money back. So they refused to get them back. Then uh, the United States tried to deport them to Japan. And <clears throat> uh, Wayne Collins happened to be at Crystal City helping the renunciants that had been transferred there. And then he heard about the uh, situation of the, the Peruvians. You know, he was outraged by what was happening to Japanese Americans. And then when he heard what the U.S. government was trying to do to the Peruvians, he became even more outraged. And uh, he stepped in and he stopped the uh, deportation of, of uh, Japanese Peruvian, Peruvians to Japan with the simple uh, idea that you can't deport people to someplace they didn't come from. Um, the next question uh, was from Judy Reynolds, and if you're comfortable answering, uh, Judy asked, "What uh, what were the stockades like at Tule Lake?" It was the stockade? Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> I I guess you could say that the stockade was uh, also a. Uh, predecessor to Guantanamo. They, they arrested people uh, based on informants. And uh, strangely enough, they arrested people for offenses they might commit because they uh, express ideas and thoughts that were anti-administration and with those kinds of words and thoughts um, <clears throat> they were potentially dangerous so they were arrested and then when they were arrested they of course were not charged and there were no hearings and there was no period of of their sentence they were there until they were released basically um, then once inside, um, the the conditions were horrendous. There were six six barracks in in the stockade. Uh, the sixth barrack was half uh, used for uh, housing prisoners, and the other half was uh, a latrine and washroom uh, and shower. Um, there were four toilets in that half barrack and four showers. And half the time, only two of the toilets worked. So there were, th yeah, at, at its peak, there were 350 men in the stockade. And for large periods of time, they only had two toilets and four showers for 350 men. So uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, strategies that the prisoners in the stockade used was to take showers at two o'clock in the morning so that there wouldn't be a crowd there. But uh, that was going on. And then uh, they had a mess hall kitchen, which was the, the seventh building in the stockade. And the government, uh, the administration only delivered small portions of rice for the amount of people that they had. And uh, many times the uh, only other food item that they delivered were like carrots. And so they were surviving on uh, maybe a quarter portion of rice and carrots. Uh, so they they were torturing people with uh, with food or with the lack of food. Um, there were times when 
this the army would require the prisoners in the stockade to stand for roll call in snowy conditions for hours. And that's what the, the stockade was like. But uh, uh, <clears throat> strangely enough, the barracks used in the stockade were better, better buildings than the barracks that they had in the camp because uh, they had been built for military personnel. Wow, that is interesting. Um, the next question we have is what efforts are being made to make sure that this history is being taught in high school so we don't ever uh, forget our history? Um, I'm not sure if Ann Lee uh, has anything to comment on that. Um, I would, but I would say that we do, our projects do make sure to reach out to, um, to local schools and, um, and, uh, make sure that they understand and it's advertised and the state does too for press releases and, um, making sure that this, these resources are available online, but there is a lot of outreach to the high schools. Um, about what we have as far as um, accessible free resources um, about this specific history. Um, but if, um, but if Ann Lee or Jenna has anything else, or Rebecca has anything else to add to that, um, you can put that in the chat. Uh, next question is from Jane Gallagher, and she asked Hiroshi um, if you think your family was one of the last released because of your father teaching um, Japanese to uh, children and others. Um, no, I, I don't think that was the reason why. I, I think um, we were incarcerated for such a long time because he felt the, res uh, the responsibility of uh, re getting others released. Uh, and I think he thought that he could do a better job of that than anyone else that was around him. Uh, <clears throat> Because I actually remember uh, at Crystal City, my mother saying to him, you're getting all these people released. What about us? But, you know, so he, he was doing all the paperwork and, and uh, making all the connections that needed to be made to get people released. And uh, to the detriment of our release. Um, and then Jane has a follow up question. Um, if you happen to know, she wanted to know if you know, um, were Italians who lived in Peru also sent to US concentration camps? There were Italians at Crystal City, uh, but not a lot. Uh, and they left before the Germans, and the Germans left uh, much before uh, we did. Uh, and I actually remember when they left, because uh, when they did, um, one of my my friends from Peru and I went through the classrooms looking for anything that might have been left, and uh, all we found. And we we, th we thought it was wonderful was chalk. Does anyone else have any more questions for Hiroshi? So we can put them in the chat. Uh, Hiroshi, is there anything else you'd like to add about uh, Day of Remembrance and what it means to you and your loved ones, your friends? Yeah. Um... I think it's absolutely necessary that we keep this tradition of day of remembrance going 
um, if if we don't do it yearly, uh, it'll slip away in you know into memory loss, basically, and uh, it's it's too egregious uh, an event to let that happen. You know, the challenge is to, every year, make it uh, int more interesting than the year before. Because we, you know, we do want people to, to come back to it and appreciate it. And if it's the same old thing every year, then it, it'll, uh, it'll disappear by that. But, but there's a big challenge for the, especially the uh, young people that are taking over this. Diane, do you have anything you'd like to say about Day of Remembrance? Uh, about the Day of Remembrance, yeah, I totally agree with what Hiroshi just shared. Um, it, it's, And I would encourage all of you on the Zoom to take a look at some of the materials that were published by the California Civil Liberties Public Education Program. Sometimes they are forgotten, but there are some really rich and uh, interesting things that are made by a number of different people. I think the way in which we can uh, keep the Day of Remembrance going is by really focusing in on the legislation that created this program, which is to also look at the linkages and parallels of what has happened in other communities, other underrepresented communities, other communities of color, to make sure that no one will ever have to go through this experience again. I mean, with the swoop of a signature, two thirds of those who were incarcerated, who were United States citizens, lost their citizenship. They had no due process rights at all. And that's something that we can never forget, no matter what. Um, I'm, I have posted a link to our website here, this last link um, is to the funded projects so that you can not only see in the press releases all the funded projects, but there's a updated list of um, those 160 projects um, that have been funded over the years uh, and the resources to get those completed resources. Um, and these include those those links I give you are to not only just find out more about the project, but do actual usable resources uh, for education purposes, for your um, for your own purposes. Um, and so go ahead and check those out, and I'll give you a main link as well here in a minute. I, I just wanted to read some of the comments. Um, 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 Lynn Hooper said, this has been a wonderful presentation. I can't imagine this, the horrors your family went through. Thank you for keeping it on the minds of Americans. Uh, Kathy uh, Sumita said, thank you for sharing your story, Hiroshi. My father was only 14 when he was interned. He really spoke of it, but affected him deeply, um, as he would always tell me, never forget. Uh, Janet asked, are other camps being preserved like Silly Lake and Manzanar? Um, I can say that, um, there are quite a few that people do visit, and, but not all of them. I'm not sure about some of the ones out of the state of California and all the ones in California as well. Um, and uh, Sabah has said, what a wonderful, heartbreaking, ultimately hopeful presentation. Thank you for sharing your photos, stories, and memories. Um, and, um, Pamela said, thank you for keeping this alive, especially as many of that generation are elderly and have passed on. And, um, and then Lindell Price says, I'm grateful that my mother told me how when she was taking dress making in trade school, the majority of her classmates were Japanese American, but at the end of the year, the class was less than half the original size because all of the Japanese American students had been interned. And uh, Shirley, and, um, or, uh, Carl Nakamura um, Guerrero has said that Shirley Enomoto uh, said, I was born in Boston in 1944. Thank you 
um, Hiroshi and California State Library. Um, and Jane Gallagher finally has said, I learned so much today. I have roommates and neighbors who are teenagers in the camp. We must expose and reflect on actions that we don't want repeated and change the future. And that is it in our chat and question. And so I just want to say thank you again to um, Hiroshi and uh, Diane and um, all the attendees and, of course, to um, Ann Lee for helping me out so much today and for Rebecca Presenti. And so now I'll pass it to um, Deputy um, State Librarian, Rebecca Wentz. Thank you. I just wanted to say again, thank you to our wonderful presenters, Hiroshi Shimizu and Diane Matsuda. Thank you all for attending today and learning a little bit more and definitely the day of remembrance is so that we don't forget and so this type of thing never happens again so keep that in mind and in your daily lives as we go about and in in the rest of our world and uh, thank you again for attending and do check out the projects that danielle put in the chat have a wonderful day